Hello everyone, this is Noah and John and we are from Urban Digs and today we're talking Manhattan. John, we're going to be talking rentals specifically today and Good. we got Adrian Savino who is the uh, Director of Leasing and Business Development over at Living New York. Mm -hmm. Okay, Great pulse on the rental market. He's going to He's gonna let us know what's going on, and Adrian, I want to I want to get right to it. Sure. So um, we got a lot of agents listening. Uh, what's going on? What's happening? What's where's the rental market at? Yeah. Well, first, appreciate you having me. Um, it's been a long time coming. I think we've been talking about it for for about a month now. Yeah. So it's, been, it's been nice to be on. I, I appreciate you having us. So just kind of diving in, um, referring to let's talk about last month specifically. Uh, we saw about seventy five hundred leases signed last month in the month of May. Uh, which is great. Obviously, those numbers are, are trending up from from the COVID lows. Uh, about 60% of those, um, 4,500 roughly, were in doorman buildings. So I know we were talking about kind of the affordable luxury segment, but we're seeing a huge move from uh, people that were, you know, currently living in walk-ups or living in walk-ups that decided to stay in the city, move to um, this affordable luxury segment. They saw prices dip. They saw concessions come up. Um, and they thought, why not trade up for, um, you know, a higher end version of what I'm currently living in. Some stayed in their neighborhoods, some moved to other neighborhoods. Um, you know, we saw a flight from certain Manhattan neighborhoods to Brooklyn and Queens. But overall, this is a trend that we were seeing um, throughout throughout COVID. Um, you know, as we rebound, we'll see if that continues or persists. But that was something that we were seeing pretty consistently throughout the throughout the you know the last year or so. Um, in regards to like overall inventory. Um, we're seeing inventory uh, around 15,000 units. That's just what's online, right? Like not everything is right. going to be represented on, on Shreezy or, you know, some of the other uh, platforms. But that's what we're seeing online, which is a, you know, a higher number, almost 150% uh, increase on uh, this time last year. So th those numbers are, are, are significantly higher. Um, absorption, we'll see how things go, but that, that's a lot usually to, uh, to, to absorb across the city. Right. And can you speak, Adrian, at all to concessions? Because I know concessions at some point were um, pretty drastic and I understand they've come back, but I'm wondering what, you know, what's the pulse on those right now? Yeah. So, I mean, again, just going back to where we were and where we are now, um, we saw concessions, you know, top out around four months. Not every segment, you know, whether it was the affordable luxury we just mentioned, um, smaller walk-up buildings we're doing, trying to kind of focus on, on, on the lower end uh, of that spectrum. But at, you know, when first when when COVID kind of first struck, you know, landlords were not really worried about you know uh, upcoming upcoming units. They were worried about their current you know tenant base. A lot of them were worried about collections and, and you know uh, tenant you know retention. So we weren't even really initially focused on that. We were focused more so on on helping our our, our clients kind of uh, address those those immediate things. And then as we started to have units turn over, people leave the city. You know, we had to kind of address uh, concessions on a, on a case by case. But we saw, you know, range two months to four months, uh, depending on neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. You know, certain neighborhoods got affected uh, more than others. Uh, Midtown East, Lower East Side, East Village, you know, neighborhoods that were historically more focused on the student population, young professionals that were, I think, sidelined in a lot of ways uh, because of what was going on. You know, some of the um, kind of the uh, service segment, like in Midtown West, where we had a lot of like theater district workers and, and you know, uh, bank bankers and, and, and uh, you know, uh, kind of consultants that lived over in those neighborhoods um, that were working remotely. We saw, you know, buildings that were generally populated by those segments uh, having to kind of rely on, on heavier concessions. Yeah. And are those concessions still there now or are they quickly fading away? Not, not it, 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 again, it, it, this is a lot of this is case by case. Uh, we're seeing concessions strip away. We're trying to do it, you know, for, for at least for our clients. Um, we're doing one month per year in, in terms of renewal. So if we had someone that signed at three months upon renewal, we would try to renew them at, you know, two to three months, right? Okay. Might, might try to renew them at one to two months. And the market is rebounding uh, pretty quickly. And we've seen this summer specifically, you know, you, you just, you know, we kind of reviewed the, the, the overall signed leases, but we're seeing that the summer has been very busy really since, you know, beginning of, uh, of 21. Interesting. Yeah. And let me ask about the beginning of 21, because, um, you know, when we were we were putting out some rental reports, you know, one of the things that we were noticing from on the landlord side is that a lot of these leases were capped at a year. So you were getting a great deal in rent, you were getting some sweet concessions, but landlords didn't want to go past a year. And I'm wondering, is that still the case? 
Yeah, most landlords are still seeing as we're, you know, we, we, we bottomed out, right? So the pricing did bottom out, we're coming out of it. But most landlords only wanted to do 12 month leases because they knew that this was, a, you know, a transitory, you know, if, if, as long as there wasn't sort of, you know, some sort of a uh, re, reigniting of, you know, a new strand or something was, was coming out that was, you know, affecting it where people were still moving out of the city. Um, most people were just looking to lock in. Most landlords were just looking to lock into, you know, a year lease, not to uh, lock in this kind of uh, concessionary pricing longer than that period. Really interesting. Um, Adrian, is it, would you agree that in the last three or four months, the rental market has kind of just shot up like a rocket? Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So and, we, go ahead. Uh, yeah, we, we've been seeing, you know, a, an entire year of supply that kind of got held over into this new year and then traditional turnover where, you know, we would already have this inventory. So the, the combination of having units left over from 20, then rolling into, you know, normal turn for 21, we've seen, um, you know, in terms of sign leases that they've, they've really skyrocketed. Um, so on a personal level for, for living, we've, we've already, you know, completed our, our entire 2020 calendar year, uh, year to date in 21. Wow. That's, that's, that's incredible. Yeah. I mean, the, what I'm thinking is here, um, we're about to start a positive price action quarterly sales cycle on the sales market sure. with Q2. So we're going to start to get some headlines that Manhattan prices are coming back. And that's coming right when the rental market has just, again, shot out like a rocket the last four months or so is what I'm hearing from a lot of my contacts. Yeah. So what do you tell landlords? What, what do landlords do over the summer? We tell landlords the same. I mean, everyone's trying to take advantage of the rebounds um, as people come back, as you know, you hear these bigger banks, bigger consulting firms, uh, bigger tech firms, everyone's passing guidance on, you know, a, a rough estimate of September to, to come back to work. You know, we think that this is going to continue into, uh, into the fall and winter. You know, generally the sales cycle is a bit different. You know, fall winter is a, a bit busier. Uh, the rental cycle is generally busier in the, in the spring, summer. So we're, I think we're going to see an extended summer rental period uh, into probably the end of, of 21. Interesting. Or historically, things would you know drop off September, October, and, and be slow yeah. until you know that that subsequent March. I think we're yeah. seeing that the uh, the rental market will persist through you know through the beginning of twenty two. It's I interesting, agree. you know, because usually usually the rental market leads the sales market, but it almost seems like the sales market has led the rentals market because it picked up yes. blue through the winter and has just only recently started to show signs that it might be topping out. But I mean, if if you look at the the just in terms of the sales market, the weeks from March all the way through the end of it, early June, mid June 14th, the week of June 14th, every single one of those has been one of the top 20 deal weeks since 2004. It's just amazing. The only exception was Memorial Day. And it seems like now that, that the rents are catching fire, but you know, on the sales side, the question that we get a lot from agents is, hey, listen, where are the deals? I have, I have you know, how do I convince my buyers that, that there's the COVID discount of you know, 20, 30% is actually not the case. And I'm curious, on the rental side, what do you do about those opportunistic renters that are thinking that I can already get a huge cut in rent and I want six months uh, concession? Yeah, so I mean, our position in the market, we kind of sit between landlord, developer, and, 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 and the, the renters. So we kind of have to play devil's advocate. You know, we need to keep velocity at a certain point to keep, you know, keep these buildings filled. Um, but we need to do so at, you know, reasonable rates and reasonable concessions. So we had to bring, you know, like we like we do historically, whether it's sales or rentals, we have to bring both parties together to figure out what what makes the most sense. Some landlords are you know are are, are more flexible. Some some are not. You know, some are their basis is different than others. Their their debt is different than others. Their positions are different than others. Uh, the return you know kind of expectations are different than others. So it really depended on you know what kind of what kind of landlord we were dealing with. Some were you know contingent on cash flow and just wanted to get you know renters in the door. Others were contingent on keeping you know, gross rents at a certain point and offering heavy concessions. So not the best answer because it's kind of, it's giving, it's painting a broader picture, but it really was a case by case thing for us, depending on our client. Yeah, no, it's, it's, was it, it's an idiosyncratic problem, right? I mean, every renter, every landlord has its own um, key, but, but it sounds almost like that, you know, if you, if you were to sort of rewind and you put yourself in landlord shoes of say, September, October, they were not saying no. It was just bring me someone who can sign something at a reasonable rate because I got I got to cover my costs. And now that you have some landlords who have a chance to say, you know what? No, I'd rather pass. Yeah, the the power is shifting back, you know, towards the landlord. Um, 
Right. And we even saw interesting data points on um, qualifications. You know, generally you want to see on the rental side people that are making 40x the monthly rent and have credit, you know, above 700. The landlords, because of the demand dipping off so much, they were they were having to accept, um, you know, deals and and individuals that were not you know traditionally or historically qualified. Well, I mean, really, really interesting, Adrian. Um, is it is it safe to say that the rental sector since COVID um, dropped about 10, 15% in terms of pricing. And then you had an additional X percent with concessions. Is that a fair assumption? Yeah. I mean, a lot of these were dipping off or topping off, excuse me, around, you know, 25 to 30% with concessions considered. All right. So you had okay, so, so 25, 30% net effective. So, okay. And it was probably a 50, 50 split between rent coming down and concessions. Is that, is that a yeah, fair a statement? Yeah. times you'll see, you know, Maybe not 50 50 exactly, but a split between drop off in, in gross number and concession offering. Okay, here's my question. Um, if, if the rental market has rebounded and come back to the point where the concessions are fading, right? It's also probably fair to say that first the concessions go, then the rents rise. Yep. That's usually the flow. Yep. Are we still seeing rents down 15%? So that hasn't, we haven't seen rents rise yet, is my question really. Yeah, to, to your point, um, usually concessions are burned off and then, then you'll see a, a, an increase on the gross rent. Some are doing both, you know, nominal increases on gross, five, you know, 7% um, as leases turn. And then they'll try to get, you know, again, if they were doing two to three months, they're doing one to two months now. So they're trying to kind okay. of combine those two things. But generally speaking, you'll try to burn off the concessions first and then look to, to increase uh, gross pricing second. Are they getting those five to seven percent from year ago leases, or are, are successfully right now? Yeah, it, it, it's dependent on on neighborhood. You know, I, I know we talked uh, a little bit earlier about you know Midtown East and, and Lower Manhattan on the east side, but you know neighborhoods like uh, Greenwich Village, West Village that you know historically have uh, more established renters, those were yeah. less affected uh, throughout the period. Here, here's why I ask because because it, it's a complete sentiment change. It's a complete. If you go back a year ago. I mean, we were kind of falling into it, right? And now we're kind of the complete other way. We're going out of it. And when I look at ground floor retail and I look at the rebuild, the rebuild or the recovery of New York City, yep. um, I think that's going to greatly impact the rental sector. And if I'm looking forward, which I like to think markets do, I know the stock market looks forward and discounts. I don't know how much the real estate market does. Um, but if I'm looking forward as an investor, we're getting close to that recovery of ground floor retail and commercial coming back now with the wave of, of, of businesses now starting to bring employees back. I mean, what do you think in that regard? Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of, again, a lot of the, the uh, bigger, you know, tech, tech firms and, and, and banks and, and consulting firms are, are setting their sites on September for, for kind of a recovery. We're seeing numbers hover around 20 to 25% in terms of uh, office occupancy. So that's, you know, increased from, you know, less, I say three to four months was, was closer to 10 to 15%. So we're seeing an increase on, on those numbers and we're seeing kind of a trend to come back. There's going to be a hybrid schedule. There's going to be people that are working from home, you know, twice a week, once a week. But overall, I think that the city will, will see people come back at, at least, at, at least in some capacity, you know, the narrative was let's reduce office footprint. Let's reduce, you know, retail footprint um, because we didn't know when the recovery was going to happen. But I think most people, didn't think it was going to happen as quickly as it, you know, it has to your point. It's interesting. So let me ask you this because I, I think Noah touched on uh, an interesting little thread I'd like to pull on. And that's that, you know, when you look at the sales market recovery, um, a lot of the recovery was in the res what you would call the residential areas. So like upper West side, upper East side actually saw a re you know, really interesting sales numbers, you know, compared to say, you know, Midtown and, you know, Midtown East, things like that were are still sort of struggling. And a lot of it has to do with exactly what you're talking about, Adrian, which is, you know, we're still waiting for, you know, storefront retail to come back office to come back. And, you know, to go back to what Noah's earlier question was, you know, are some of these landlords getting these price increases? I'm wondering, is it possible to break it down by neighborhood to say like, yeah, it, it's, it's much more, and you mentioned the Greenwich Village, but I'm, I'm curious about some of the larger residential neighborhoods like the, the west side, the east side, are they a little bit more stable in terms of rents um, yeah. versus say Midtown? Yeah, I mean, the, like the vacancy rates, uh, I'll go back to the kind of the specific neighborhoods, but the, the vacancy rates we saw the highest were in Midtown East, East Village, Lower East Side, you know, um, yeah. those were commercial neighborhoods or, you know, contingent on students and professionals for the most part in terms of like renter base. Um, 
vacancy at lowest rate we were seeing in like Battery Park, Financial District, Grand Edge, and West Village. Um, again, those are historically, you know, stronger uh, renter pools, you know, renter bases. So those were less affected and less transient. Mm -hmm. But I think you're going to see that kind of rebound um, across the board. You know, M Midtown will probably be the last to, um, given it's not as residential as, as other neighborhoods throughout Manhattan and Brooklyn. Um, that'll probably be the last area to, to rebound fully. Right. So and let me John, add, just to, go ahead. Just to add to your point, I want to add to your point. It's almost like we could see ahead what's happening here as well. Like if you think about how the sales market, the next two, three quarters, we're going up, right? The rental market, the next two, three quarters, we're going up. Like we could, we could see in the future cap rates. I wonder what's going to happen with cap rates. Is, is that, is that equation going to change? Cause cap rates, if you think about what they've done, there's been no, there's no value in New York City from, yeah. a, from an investment standpoint, right, Adrian? Yeah, I mean, it, it's tough to say. I was actually listening to uh, Peter and uh, the Marcus and Chat team on Behind the Bricks, and they were, they, were, they were talking about the cap rates compressing more so. Um, I, it's a lot of people, you know, from the investment sales realm were, were looking to, to, to other markets to find, you know, yields. And I think a lot of them are going to start coming back. You know, a lot of people are looking in Florida, the Sun Belt right. State, the West, yeah. you know, uh, or the West Coast. Um, and it, it seems like a lot of them are are seeing that New York is rebounding. And if you can get a five cap here versus a five cap elsewhere, why would you, you know, why would you look for for uh, you know ancillary markets, or, or I should say, look to ancillary markets? Yeah, yeah. Right. And, and I really wonder. And and I think if I mean we're nowhere near a five cap, but I mean if 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 we're at a one or or, or some we've been questioning that with the net effectives on rent because we couldn't measure that real accurately. Right. Um, if we can get up to a three, a three handle on that or a four handle on that, then very attractive. And those investors will come in and yeah. that's something that hasn't happened yet. And that's another thing that could just buoy, buoy this whole market. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, hundred percent agree. Yeah. And I guess I'd like to kind of, you know, round this out, but, you know, and it's a, a great segue is to talk about, you know, if you, if you're, a, if you're looking at this market from a future perspective, which we were just, we were just talking about it, like, how do you. We've already seen what I would say is pretty much the worst that could happen. You know, a, a, a pandemic coming in, hitting rentals at a, at, a, at a period in time in which most of them are coming vacant anyway, right? The summer and then having rents get hurt. Uh, it, it, it was pretty much a clockwork, perfect storm. And I'm wondering the lessons learned, like you talk about the vacancy rates that are higher in the East Village, which I don't think many people would have predicted through this. So we've, we've, we've had a lot of, we had a chance to shake out a lot of the, a lot of the, the bugs here. Um, how are, how are landlords going to go about future proofing this? And you know, are they going to make any changes to the way leases are structured? Are they, is it going to be less reliant on a summer season? Um, is it going to be a, a more diverse mix of tenants and buildings? I'm just curious what the thought, if, if, if you know what the thought on landlords is there. Great. Yeah, question. absolutely. Uh, I mean, for future proofing, there's, you know, again, there's different building types. If you're talking about, you know, walk-up building versus, versus luxury building, um, you're getting creative with your space, getting creative with your lease terms, getting creative with your requirements. A lot of landlords, again, to, to kind of reference something we spoke about before, uh, requirements were, were very rigid in the city. Landlords kind of had the, the power in that regard um, with, you know, companies like the Guarantors, Rhino, Obligo that are giving, um, you know, they're giving coverage for uh, renters that wouldn't have access to apartments beforehand. They're giving uh, security deposit replacement options. They're giving access to a new, you know, to speak to your diversity question. You know, they're giving access to people that didn't historically have uh, the option to rent in some of these buildings. So that's been an interesting kind of transition on that front. In terms of the buildings themselves, we're, we're getting pretty granular with our owners on, on how to add value. Um, you know, if cap rates are at a certain point, you need to look to how you're going to add, you know, kind of squeeze more value out of these buildings. Yeah. And I think there's going to be a focus on uh, shared office space within buildings, smaller kind of like cut up offices that you can go to during the day. If you're working from home, you know, twice a week, it'll be nice to, you know, leave your kitchen or, or living room or bedroom desk and, and go to a, you know, a small common space within the building to, to work for a couple hours just to break up the monotony. Um, so we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of our language focus on, you know, building out, um, you know, smaller shared offices within, within their residential buildings, um, not to lease to third parties, but to just offer to their current tenant base. Um, maybe it's small. That's a great idea because when you think about, you know, the the idea that capital improvements are now completely restricted in terms of how you can re recapitalize those, the yeah. idea that you could have something that adds value to the building, but then you can charge on top of because it's a separate thing is a is a Love very it. clever idea. 
Yeah, and that can be something that can be hidden value too. You can, you know, give it to the tenants uh, free of charge as a, you know, kind of a concession that's not monetary. Give it to them as a, you know, free one year trial at the at the gym or a free one year trial at our, our new shared office space, and and you can start charging on top of that, at, you know, in, in subsequent uh, lease terms. Good stuff. This is great. Yeah. Adrian, this has been fantastic. We're, we're, we're out of time, but I mean, um, we're going to have you back and, and this has been fantastic. I just want to ask you, I mean, we've been talking about a lot of um, interesting future positive trends, macro kind of things. Are there any risks? Let's just, let's just be open here. Are there any risks to any policy changes that you see maybe ahead or anything that could derail what we think is a recovery that's just beginning? We'll see. I mean, the, the primaries were yesterday. The, you know, the, the official vote will be in November. So a lot of that, if Eric Adams you know, continues to be the, the front runner, you know, we'll, we'll see what his, uh, uh, his promises, uh, what he uh, upholds. So it depends on a lot of the, uh, a lot of it depends on the mayoral race. Uh, other, I guess, exposures for landlords are whether or not people do come back. You know, they all, they all do come back to the city. We're seeing those trends right now, but you know, that's a, a six month uh, sample size. We haven't seen it over a long enough period of time to understand if that's gonna be, you know, a, a bigger macro trend. Yeah, that, what, what, a, what a fantastic answer. Th thank you for mentioning the, the sample size and, and being completely transparent on that. We, we have to see if this continues and that's a great yeah, answer to that. Absolutely. So um, Adrian Savino, this has been fantastic. Uh, Director of Leasing over at Living New York. If you have any questions for him, just, you know where to contact. Great episode. Thank you so much. That is John Walkup. I am Noah Rosenblatt. We're both of Urban Digs. This has been Talking Manhattan, and we'll catch you next time. Cool. Thanks, guys.